I'll never forget like the noise coming from your team all day was just absolutely relentless and um, so 90 kind of was funded. Ninety-five percent funded. The other five percent. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe together with Guinness. Game changed. Hello and welcome along to House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe together with Guinness. I'm Imran Considine and as always I'm joined by Ian Madigan. And in part two we'll be joined by former Connacht, Leinster and Ireland lock Mike McCarthy. But in a complete change of pace we're first joined by a Connacht and Ireland lock who used to play for Leinster. Quinn Roo, welcome to House of Rugby. Thanks guys, how are you? We're good, great to have you on Quinn. Cheers. Quinn, how's it been having a weekend off, a strange weekend off after a really busy, hectic schedule of rugby? Uh, yeah, it's been kind of the story of the year so far, but um, perfect timing for me, really. My parents are over from uh, South Africa to meet my our first child. So they did the whole quarantine for two weeks and they, they got into the house uh, a week ago after the Monster game. So it's great to have them yeah, and spend some time with family. And so... Having the week off now has actually worked perfect for me, so it's very, been very enjoyable. That's great. How's baby Remy getting on? Very good, thank you. Growing up very fast, almost six teeth already, so it's mad how quickly they'll grow up. But um, yeah, she's keeping us busy and awake. <laughs> <laughs> not ideal timing for, you know, does she not realise how busy the schedule is? She has no consideration. What age is she? She's almost nine months already, so she's a lock, lockdown baby. She was born right at the start of lockdown. Yeah. Um, there's a serious lack of rugby this weekend, and obviously it's just the world that we live in at the moment with the Champions Cup and the Challenge Cup, both postponed. Um, what does it look like going ahead, I suppose, both for Ulster and for Connacht? Starting with you, Quinn, you know, what does this mean for Connacht that the games mightn't be scheduled or they might just go to a knockout round after the Guinness Six Nations? I don't know, to be honest. And I think the main thing is like, no one really knows until it's been said to someone, like you can ask coaches or captains or heads, heads or CEOs, but they don't really know. So it's, that's the kind of the worst thing for me is not having any of the certainty and not knowing when the next game is. At least we found out yesterday that we have a game this Sunday coming. So at least we have that to get a bit of game time and hopefully put your hand up for those Six Nations games. But further than that, we don't really know what's going to happen. And I guess, that's that's the hard bit, not knowing what's going on. I'm sure Mads will know that feeling, but yeah, that's that's the only bit I really struggle with. So there's there's no certainty. Yeah, I think for us um, in Ulster, obviously we haven't had any games called off. So there was supposed to be the two European games this week, and then there was a, a, going to be a break in the league for three weeks, which you know I'm sure would have been welcomed off the back of a, a long run of games. But as it stands now, I don't think we're going to play for effectively five weeks from our last game, which was Leinster last weekend. Um, so f- for us as players, you know, we, we all want to be playing week in, week out. But when an opportunity like this presents itself in the middle of the season, it does give you an opportunity to work on some things that, you know, you, you can't work as hard on going week to week, game to game, because, you know, your body's obviously sore after playing games. Um You've got it. You're you're always training within a team environment, whether it's team pitch sessions or team gym sessions, where you're being prescribed specific stuff that you've to do. So for for me this week and and uh, last week just gone, it gives me an opportunity to catch up on some weights that I've missed out on, some speed agility stuff, maybe getting some extra kicking sessions in, so that when games do come back around, we're we're feeling fresh and and ready to go. Absolutely. Quinn, you had two unwanted, I suppose, rest weeks, um, which meant that you missed some of the other Champions Cup games, unfortunately. Yeah, I got deemed a close contact after the week after that Scotland game. We had a week or a day of training and then we usually get tested on the Tuesday and then everybody has that dreaded wait on a Wednesday morning to see <laughs> is anyone positive. Uh, and I just, I was a close contact for the mere fact that I changed the book with a, a guy that tasted positive. So that, that knocked me out for two full weeks. So um, it's, it's absolutely crazy, but that's just the world we live in at the moment. So I got a good break there. So 
I remember hearing about that. Yeah. I wasn't, I didn't realize it was you, but um, off the back of you being a close contact from sharing a bid, um, we very quickly That's brought in all the books. No, was no in the <laughs> 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 Our poor bag man, our poor bag man, because um, just so people are aware, obviously, both teams generally train in bibs and. For me and Quinn, who would have been trained under under Pat Lamb, he has you know the front five forwards in a different color, the back row in a different yeah. color, the halfbacks in a different color, the centers in a different color, and the back three in a different color because he uses a drone for his recording of, of trainings, so he can you know see exactly how his patterns of play are working from the drone from the colors. So if you're not in the right spot, your color will show up very quickly. But um, yeah, our, our poor our poor bag man up in Ulster has been. He's been working double time now with all the washing he's got to be doing. <laughs> he absolutely panicked. I've been avoiding now. webs in training. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, don't bring that thing near me, please. <laughs> if you listen to our conversation last week, you probably realize that all of us are trying to avoid the bibs in training, which I know never knows what it yeah. means. Um, no. yeah. no. Quinn, yourself and Ian would have played a season and a half with each other in Leinster. Um, under the Joe Schmidt and Matt O'Connor eras, you had some success when you played together. Um, any standout memories that you remember playing with Leinster and playing with Ian in particular? I think the first season was probably the best one in Leinster. Um, to be honest, there was a lot of injuries for a young lad coming in. I was only 21 years old, first time overseas, um, which is crazy to think about. Um, we won two trophies that year, which was great. Ulster in the final in the Pro 12, I think. And then in the... I think back then you get knocked out of the Champions Cup, you play in the Challenge Cup playoffs or something. I think we played Stade Francais in the final that year, which was great. So that would probably be the style of memories for me from playing my days in Leinster. Um, yeah, it's, it's good times. It's always nice winning trophies. <laughs> when you said that you moved halfway through the season on loan to Connacht, you know, what was the decision maker in that? You were, what, 21, 22 years of age? Um, it wasn't, I don't think it was completely my decision. I just think Matt O'Connor kind of wanted to bring in someone else. And I took up uh, a foreign spot at that stage. I was Irish qualified. I think Kane Douglas that time came in after the year after. And I wasn't really sure what to do. Um, so I actually spoke to Joe that time. He was gone with the Irish team. And um, I was like, look, I don't think I don't think my services are needed here anymore, and uh, I'm, I might leave. But um, if if you think that I should stay and there's plans for me in the future, I could definitely do it. And that that kind of brought up the Connacht kind of thing. So yeah, I don't think I've told the story ever before, but that's how it actually happened. So Pat Pat Lamb contacted me and said, "Look, come and play here for for six months, and then um, we'll see how it goes." And then I still had a year left with my contract in Leinster, and then. Um, I just decided to stay in Galway and it's been seven years since so it's, been, it's worked out well for me personally so yeah it's great as well I suppose from being someone who was only 21 coming over to, to Europe and Ireland and being able to work with three go you know three coaches who all have a very different style you know and Joe Schmidt in your first year uh, Matty in your second year and then working with with, with Pat Lamb it, was, it must have been a great kind of tuition for the start of your career um, I had Rossi Erasmus before Joe as well in, in the storm. Yeah. So I think I've been I've been very fortunate with only some of the best coaches in the world that I've worked under. So I always think about it in that way. I've been very fortunate. So um, yeah, a lot of different ways of doing it, but they all have like found success in their own in their own way. So it's been it's been great. Yeah. Yeah. For for me, looking from the outside in, it looks like Andy Friends really kind of brought the team together. The, the attack is really purring this year um, for you being within the squad. You know, what, what is it that's kind of brought you together and has you, you playing so well? Um, I think Friendly's biggest thing is just bringing confidence into his players. Like he doesn't really, it's not, it's not someone who's going to tell you like, you have to do this, you have to do it this way or that way. You just kind of say like, this is your weapon and you should do it to the best. I'm not going to tell you to change anything, but I think that's where players get their confidence in. Because I think we're all there, pretty good rugby players, but we need to kind of show it in the way we want to. And I think that's what he's encouraging. And I think that's that's why he gets some players like loves to play with that confidence, whereas other coaches kind of 
wants to change the way you're playing, that might break your confidence. So I think that's what Frankie does really well is he puts the confidence in players just to go out there and, and do what they do really well and enjoy it. Yeah, you can really see that. Like I, I remember my first game back in, in Ireland was against Connacht in, in the Aviva, the you know, finishing off the tail end of last season. And I'll never forget like the noise coming from your team all day was just absolutely relentless. And um, so 90% kind of shed- was Bundy. Ninety-five percent funny. The other five percent, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, look, it was it was in fact just what he brought that day, and it was nearly it was nearly daunting for us playing against it. You know, it was it was like once he got going, you couldn't stop him, and if you tried to come up against it, you'd nearly feel like you was um, you're losing a one-on-one battle with him and. Um, when, we, when it came around to us playing you guys uh, a few weeks ago, we were like, look, we're going to have to bring this atmosphere because it would just yeah. seemed like it en- energized you all day. And if you don't match that when you're playing Connacht or any of the Interpros games, you're not going to stand a chance. Yeah, I think absolutely, like, especially with no crowds being there, because you can hear everything everyone says to each other, whereas if there's crowds roaring, you can't really hear. So it's pretty clear what players say to each other and some that, that winds people <laughs> up the wrong way. And you can get into each other's head like that. But um, I think the main thing, I think it's been said all over. I think every team says that, like, you have to create your own energy because the crowd's not there to do it for you. And sometimes it works for you and sometimes, like, it works against you. But that positive energy is something that's, he obviously always brings for us and it's something that we kind of have to do to kind of make sure we stay on top of it. Going back to that positive energy, I know from being pitch side doing some of the games, some of the Interpro games, there was just, the rivalry between the teams was so evident. You know, there was, there was I think it was louder than any other game. Do you feel like playing those Interpro games, like it is even more intense than normal games just because they're the Interpro games? Yeah, one on, it is because it's it's basically trials for Ireland, isn't it? It's you want to play against the guy who's maybe picked ahead of you last the last campaign, or you have to prove maybe that you deserve to stay in the squad. And there's maybe a young lad coming up, or you want to take someone else's place. And it's all that kind of little battles in between in between each other, and then that just makes the hype and the kind of build up towards it massive and uh, the crowds love that as well. And everyone, that's why everyone watched those games because they want to see those little battles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Quinn, I think one question that a lot of people are asking is you were very, very young when you first made that decision to come to Ireland. What were you, 19, 20 years of age coming from Stormers? 20 20 years of age. Like it's very young to make such a move, but like what, you spent one year with the Stormers with some phenomenal players. So you obviously gained lots of experience under Razzy Erasmus as well and with some of those players around you. To make such a decision at such a young age, you know, what was going through your mind? Yeah, it was kind of unheard of back then for a young lad to kind of leave before his career almost even started. Usually players go in the back of the careers to make to make a bit of money. But for me, it was a weird one, really. Um, I was playing really well as a young lad and I was up and coming and just getting into the, the senior setup. And then I got a, a quite a bad shoulder injury, which out for six months. And then in that time, Ivan Etzebeth became Springbok and he was a year younger than me. So <laughs> that kind of <laughs> put a span into the works. <laughs> but that wasn't, that, that wasn't the reason why I left. I just thought, oh, I was kind of, I think maybe a year away would, would, would kind of freshen my mind and I've experienced something completely different, different culture. I've never been overseas. This is a great opportunity for me to go away for a year and then and then see how it goes afterwards, whether I come back or stay. I didn't really know. And then yeah, it's 10 years later now and I'm still here and loving life. So it's a, it's a decision that was quite daunting, but I'm delighted that I made it at the end of the day. When you were coming over, Quinn, at, at 20, were you aware of, you know, the residency rule, how it worked and, the, you know, the potential that you could you could play for Ireland? Not at all. Not at all. I was very, I was very immature. Man. I, was, I was thinking back now, I just actually can't believe <laughs> that I made such a big decision because thinking back now, it's massive. It's it's obviously changed my life in, in the best way possible. And we, we set up a life for ourselves over here and my wife's quite happy and, and I, I've set up a future for my for my little girl that might be a safer future than it would have been back home so it's a crazy decision when you look back at it but it's it's been the best one yet so far but 
Um, I wasn't aware of like, look, I'm going to come over for a year and try and sign for two more years to try and play for Ireland. It certainly became an option for me the year after the year that I signed, sorry, after the year that I initially was in Leinster and then I re-signed for two years. And then that was where the chat started coming on. Look, I think, I think I'm going to stay here because obviously really enjoyed the culture, the people, and I thought I could make a life for myself here. Well, 16 caps later and 14 in the last three years, it's it's really worked out for you, I suppose, in a way that you never would have imagined. And you're playing some great rugby and I suppose great to get that opportunity to play with Ireland and I suppose to represent your adopted country. Yeah, it's people find it strange when you talk about it, but like it, this is my adopted country. Like I'm a citizen here at the moment and when I put that jersey on, I represent the people, especially the people from Galway. It's been brilliant to me and my family. So that's that's the people I represent when I go there, and and that makes me really proud. So that's that's something that I I'm hungry for to do more. And it's been great getting that having that few um, games over the autumn where I felt I found some great form, and I'm I'm looking to build on that now, and hopefully I get an opportunity to do to do that. But yeah, it's. It's something you're very proud of, but you, you can't get satisfied with it. You just you just want to do it more and more. Absolutely. And you recently hit your 100 cap in with Connacht Rugby, and there's a really nice story, and it was a really special day for you in particular. Yeah, um, I'm a sucker for those ones. <laughs> when I see stuff, when I see stuff like that online, I get a little <laughs> nod in the throat, and then it actually happens to me. <laughs> Yeah, my dad flew over without me knowing it. So it was, yeah, they, a friend who was really good with that. He kind of does special things when guys get down and cut where they'd make a little video or they'd have someone like your mom and dad come and represent your jersey for you before the game. And I was expecting, look, maybe I'll get a nice video from the family back home. And um, Rain just walked into the change room with my jersey and she's like, look, we're really all proud of you. And, uh, Here's your jersey, but uh, this is not this is not the main the main person who wants to congratulate you. And then in walks my dad into the change room without knowing anything. And That's then I just incredible. I couldn't I just couldn't I just had to kind of put my hands in front of my face <laughs> because there was people filming and I was like I can't let people see me. <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, that that is something I'll definitely definitely never will forget. Um, we didn't get the result at the end of the day, but um, it was, yeah, it was a very special, very special moment. I'll never forget it. Yeah, it's a great story. I, yeah, I think for like hearing that about a head coach doing that, like who's thoughtful enough and has that relationship with his players and, you know, he'll get that back from you. You know, it might not necessarily yeah. have been that game straight away, but, you know, six months down the line, and you know, the club's gone through tough times. You don't forget something like that. And, you know, that it's incredible hearing stories like that. And it's a big part of what what rugby is i suppose yeah no it's it's created a good family there and, and the main thing is he, when he thinks a player might be distracted with something like that he'd go up to him before and say look we, we we might do this before the game do you want this before or after the game so so he's, he's he's still like game focused and making sure that this is not going to disrupt the team or or the player itself so yeah, I decided to go before the game without knowing what was going on. I might, I might have decided to do it <laughs> after if, if I knew my dad was going to walk in. <laughs> for anybody uh, who for who hasn't seen the video, it's actually on his Instagram. If you want to see Quinn crying, it's all filmed there, yeah, please, and it's really please, <laughs> it's a, it's a really nice it's a really nice video to watch. Going back to Andy Friend. He has signed some amazing players in the last few years, and a lot have come from other provinces, and you've gained from you know, people, you know, on loan or people making the decision to actually stay with Connacht. And do you think that's part of, you know, the Connacht culture at the moment that guys want to try harder just to prove, you know, that they're good enough, they're good, they're good enough to play at this level, they're good enough to put it up against those teams. And and I think we all saw it against Leinster a few weeks back in the, the gutsy performance that you had. Yeah, I think a lot of players especially in Ireland is is kind of very wary of going going to Galway because of the nature of of, of the sports ground and but you, you see players coming in from other provinces they they immediately kind of 
buy into buy into what's going on there and they they fall in they fall in love with the people from Galway and the team and there's not a lot of clicks or kind of little it's all one big one big group and players get get taken in very quickly no matter where you're from so um i think that's a big part of of why players ended up staying there or tend to stay on there it's it's just taking the kind of step and actually going and making that decision that might be better for your career because you you, you get minutes there look at some of the guys like alex Horton playing now he's playing class right if, if he was in monster he probably wouldn't have played so you see he's one of the top try scorers now so there's a lot of those examples but i'm just using him as one of them but yeah i think um one, once you get there you kind of understand why why lads love playing for the club it's not because of the weather in Galway, for sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom Daly, Tom Daly's another guy who's, who's come in and he's been at Cork a few years now. A good example of someone who was probably behind some really quality players um, in Leinster, didn't really get a run of games, got a few opportunities, but it, it just shows when, when a coach backs you and puts his confidence in you, you, you get the results and, and you know, if you look at Tom's performances, especially this season, he's been he's been phenomenal, and he's 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 someone who I'm sure is pushing for international selection now. Yeah, it's it's just it's clear to see, isn't it? Like you can see when someone plays with confidence and it's like week in week on putting in big performances, and yeah, like I said, it's all about confidence, and that's what kind of friendly installs into the players. And yeah, he's he's he was sitting behind some pretty decent centres in Tom Farrell, Bundy, Aki, Peter Rob, international colour. I think the last few weeks he's been certainly putting his hand up. Yeah, just Quinn from the Interpro games. You know, you just said that the the Interpro games are essentially an Irish selection. You know, selection process. What players have impressed you just across the provinces in the last few weeks that you know would be in contention for a call up or even on that extended squad? Um, I think Tom, obviously, he's been playing really well. I think Alex from from us, Alex Wooten, has been playing really well. I'm not going to just block Connacht players here. I'll think of what. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We had Ulster bias last weekend. We can have Connacht bias this week. <laughs> no, um, I think, obviously, Ryan Bear has been playing really well as well. He's been in the mix or he missed out their injury. Um, I think he's a great six. Not, not certainly not a second row. <laughs> he's definitely not a second row. <laughs> can't wait to lose to them. He's wasted he's in waste. the second row, that fella. Yeah. You can't waste waste that as little sit him in the second row, mate. <laughs> nah, I think he's been playing really well and he's definitely someone who's gonna play for Ireland for a long time. So um who else? Um all the Leinster back row lads, they've all been there and about. They've serious players over there. And the, there's a young lad in Monster the, is it Coombs, Gavin Coombs, he's been playing yeah. really well. And then you have Craig Casey who's been in camp for a day or two with us during the autumn, who's been playing really well. So there's loads of young players, I think, which is exciting and it's probably healthy for, for squad pressure as well. Yeah, obviously we heard the announcement of Paul O'Connell as as um forwards coach. Um, I'm sure you've played against Paulie a few times and, and been in camp uh, with him. Is is that something, you know, as an announcement that was a, was made, was it something that excited you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't think, I think he was finished by the time I came into camp for the first time, but I definitely played a few, against him a few times and I think his name kind of speaks speaks for itself. So I think it's it's going to be really exciting to have someone like that in camp and just to kind of pick his brains and I think you'll definitely add to the environment without a doubt. Brilliant. For sure. Um, for the Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame, we asked you if you had any good questions for, for Quinn and big fan Jay Long came up with something we'd love to know too. So his question was, what eventually convinced Quinn to end the mullet? <laughs> You're going to hear oh, it first here. It's something I'm still regretting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know really. I think it just ran its course. I just said it was very impulsive. I just, we went to uh, the Shelburne Hotel and the, I heard the barbers was open and I just said, ah, oh, it's done now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk out of this place and go and get it done. <laughs> and then when it was finished, I was like, I probably should have thought about it a bit longer before I made that decision. But I guess it, it can always go back. Um, yeah, a lot of people enjoyed it, but I got some pretty 
bad comments from there as well. <laughs> but like, it was I just, I just needed one bad game and it was going to be gone anyway because it would have been the mullets fault, the bad game anyway. <laughs> it's like, it was that idiot with the mullets. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, yeah. look, it's, it's always good if people are talking about you no matter what. Um, yeah. So this is supposed to wrap and to finish up. Are you looking forward? You know, it's going to be a busy year, but are you looking forward to the Guinness Six Nations? Yeah, hopefully if, if I'm involved um, and, and if it goes ahead. So... There's been talks of it not going ahead, but I'm pretty sure or I'm pretty hopeful that it would go ahead. And we have one game left this week against Ospreys to kind of put your hand up for selection and hopefully get involved there and hopefully add a few more caps to my name and hopefully hopefully get a contract as well. That would be nice to know that I'd have a job for next year. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. And I guess in, in today's world with, with everything that's going on, at least we can still play rugby and do our job and do what we love. So I think putting things into perspective, that's that's the main thing. It's just make sure that we kind of enjoy it, whether you get selected or not, is make sure that we are fortunate enough to be doing our jobs. Well, Ru, um, Queen Ruth, thank you so much for coming on and hopefully we will see you in a green jersey very soon again and hopefully you'll be employed by the end of this season in Ireland here. <laughs> Um, that's it for part one and we're back in part two with a man who has already warned us to bring our A game that chat will be with Mike McCarthy House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe together with Guinness game changed we are now joined by a guy that has started his rugby career in London, had a brief stopover in Galway, played with Johnny Wilkinson at Newcastle, came back and played six more seasons with Connacht before finishing out his career with Leinster and winning 19 caps with Ireland. It's Mike McCarthy. Welcome to the show. Eight, two, three, four. Yes, two, three, four. Squeeze! <laughs> Guys, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's Mike. Great to have you on, bud. Mike, you know how to make an I'm entrance. I'm delighted to be on. Thank you very much for having me. I've been very excited all day. We heard you've been annoying producer Pat for the last year to get you back on. <sighs> yeah, I thought you'd forgotten about me. And then when Mads told me, I was chatting to Mads, Mads said, oh, we should get you on. I was like, I, th I thought Pat had forgotten me. So I know you want the big stars on, so. We only get the best. Mike, yourself, we just had Quinn Roo actually on in part one. You and Quinn Roo would have crossed paths in the 2013-2014 season at Leinster. Did you guys play together much? I think we had a season together. And um, yeah, Quinn, first of all, he's a great man um, and a big, big unit, as you know. Uh, so yeah, it's great to see how successful he's been in his, you know, recently. Uh, with that move to Connacht, it's been great for him. He's played incredibly well. I think he said uh, he's 100 caps and, you know, a good few for Ireland now. And, um, yeah, he's a, he's a beast of a man. He's a big man. He adds huge weight in the scrum. He's a nuisance around the mall and stuff. And, you yeah, know, he's a big presence for any team he's playing for. So it's uh, I'm delighted to see how well he's going. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How does a London man end, end up in Galway first off? Yeah, well, listen, I'll, I'll cut this story down, but it's it's a bit of a weird one. Basically, all my life I've had abuse. I've had abuse from the Irish lads for having an English accent. I've had abuse from the English lads for playing for Ireland. But it all started, I was born in London. I qualify through my grandparents, who are from the bleakest part of Ireland in Mayo. Um, so I was playing in England, playing at Falcons. Started my first two years pretty much every game. Third year, Rob Andrew got the England job. A new coach came in. I didn't feature. A bit like what happened to Quinn with Leinster. So... Uh, I moved to, to Connacht, had a great time there, absolutely loved it. And sorry, going back a bit, actually, I did, I was doing Ireland, a lot of people don't realise this, I was doing Ireland under 21s when I was at Wasps. I was flying over, I was doing the training, but I wasn't getting in any of the match day squads. So eventually I said, look, I'm going to have to park this, I'm going to have to concentrate on Wasps and get, you know, I want to get a senior contract. So I parked the Ireland stuff, but that was my first choice to play for Ireland. Uh, went back to Wasps and... It came to the summer and I got asked to go to the under 20s World Cup with England. Now, anyone who's a player just wants to play at the highest level they possibly can do. So I went away with England to the under 20s World Cup and it was so awkward. We landed at the airport in Johannesburg and who was going through passport control? I'm there with England, Ireland are in the next row along <laughs> and I'm like, oh, face down, lads, there's a death stare at me. Most awkward thing. And then it gets even worse. They were staying in the same hotel as us. So 
I was literally trying to time myself going down to breakfast to, to avoid the Irish boys. Um, but here, that's 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 part and parcel of it. So that's what happened to me. Um, but yeah, had a great time in Ireland. Loved my time at Connacht, and obviously loved my time at Leinster. So in between going back to Leinster, you played was it um, twenty four times for Connacht, and then made the decision to go back again to England. So what what happened in, in that decision making process? Yeah, I think so. As I said, my two years at Falcons, where I pretty much started every game, um, then. You know, happens. A new coach comes in, and your face might not fit. Uh, Rob Andrew had signed me from Connor initially. He he left, and um, a new coach came in. I didn't I didn't feature, um, so that was the reason I, I went back to Connor. But my first spell at Connor, I actually I went I'd gone over to try and get experience. I was a young lad. I just needed to be playing first team rugby, and you know I didn't I didn't start for Connor in that first year. It was Michael Swift and Damien Brown and Andrew Farley were all ahead of me, but. I, I did play a lot of rugby, but more at six, more more at flanker. Um, so then, obviously, because I was because I was playing quite a lot, I was on the radar. And Rob Andrew picked me up, and that's how I ended up going to Newcastle, um, somewhere I, I'd never been before in my life. And then, was it like you were going begging back to Connacht again after that when you decided to go back three years later? Well, actually, I wasn't begging. I was. Um, <laughs> Michael Checker tried to sign me for Leinster, and this is part, probably one of my things that I wish I was better at when I was playing. I wish I had more confidence in myself because I, I should have just said, oh, back yourself, go to Leinster. You're going to play, you're going to start. But I, I didn't back myself. I, you know, I, I went for the option. I went to Connacht because I thought I had a better chance of playing rugby. And um, that's probably one of the things that, you know, I wish I was better at when I was playing in terms of having more confidence in myself. Because, um, you know, you never know what, what more I could have achieved. But uh yeah, I, I end up going to Connacht, and as you know, I, I love my time there. Galway is a great place um, and great players, and it's been great to see where Connacht have got to now. You know, re- winning the Pro 12, um, you know, that was amazing to see. And you know, I certainly w- look back and wish you know I had played at a time when they had those resources. I always think we had a great forward pack. Um, we had a great starting 15, but if we started to ship any kind of injuries, the, the, the strength and depth just wasn't there. Um, we had a very small back line back then. Uh, we called it the forwards. We used to call them the Smurfs. Um, but now, you know, the likes, I would have loved to have played with the likes of Bundy. Robbie had only just started coming through. You know, see Tom Daly now, some big, big men. So, you know, it been great to have played with that, with that kind of a back line. So, Mikey, you eventually did make the decision to move to Leinster. You're lucky enough to have lots of success there. What were the highlights you had when you were playing, playing in the blue? Yeah, I eventually moved to Leinster because I nearly joined the year Sean Cronin and Fionn Carr joined. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, I, you know, I ended up staying. You know, I'd, you know, I decided to give it another two years at Connacht. Um, but eventually I did join. And I suppose memories-wise was uh, winning the Pro, was it Pro 12 back then? Pro 12? Um, I've yeah. still got a picture of you, Mads, on my screensaver. It's that picture of us winning the Pro, <laughs> Pro 12 against Glasgow, um, the, the team picture. So... That for me was uh, an amazing memory. Um, you know, unlike yourself, who's won multiple trophies, it, you know, I, I haven't been in that boat like you. So um, that was kind of amazing for me. So that was a big highlight. Um, and also the fact I, I was out injured before that final for about six weeks with a calf injury and, you know, just just made it back to, to play in that final. Uh, the family were there. So that was a big day. It was a real sunny day at the RDS, wasn't it? Um, and yeah, I, I suppose sometimes, Mads, you remember, don't you, that more the more the losses than the wins. And I, yeah. I suppose a couple stick out for me. <laughs> Two games we both played in again. Uh, that 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 game <laughs> against the All Blacks in 2013, uh, yeah. where we were winning on 80, 80, 80 minutes. They kept the ball for four and a half minutes and scored in the corner. I've never I've never cried after a game, but that was one game I did cry after. And another one I cried after was that semi final away to Toulon, where they extra time they scored where, you know, Mads, we, sh- we should have won that game before extra time, shouldn't we? Yeah, two glorious mess-ups there that you've touched on. A missed tackle by me in the corner and an intercept <laughs> against Toulon. But sure, that's <laughs> no, that wasn't, that, no, that wasn't you, mate. That wasn't you. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, look, we, we, we both know we, we, we could have beaten Toulon, you know, and, and that was a real killer that year because, you know, we, we hadn't gone well in the league. Um, all, our, our, all our eggs were in the European basket and we knew that we were good enough to beat Toulon and we could have gone on and, and, and won the final that year. And, you know, I was, that's, that's a loss that's, that's stuck to me to this day. It's, a, you know, um, 
as you said there, it's not necessarily winning trophies that, that stays with you. It's it's yeah. often the, the losses that sting that you have to live with. Yeah, I still have nightmares, man, about that sometimes. Honest, being honest, being honest with you, I do. Like sometimes those two games, you just, you're sitting there lying in bed or, and still, I'm retired three years now and still those two memories will come into my head. So. Yeah, yeah. No, like, you, like you'd have played, what, two or 300 games throughout your career, you know, your phenomenal career. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's times you go, oh, I just, I'd love to have those two or three games back and just have another go at them. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, I think no matter what you've achieved um, in the game, whether you're like a legend like you know Drico or Paulie or yourself, Mads, you know you always look back and think, you know, I could have, how, you know, I think you always want more and think you could have achieved more. And certainly, I look back at my career and you know my family say to you, oh, you know, you should be so proud. But you know, I am proud. But you know, I look back and think, you know, I could have and should have achieved achieved more. But that's you know that's down to me. You were going to make the decision to move to France after you had finished with Leinster, but you decided to hang up your boots. Was it prematurely decided then for you, or do you regret not making that decision in the end? Yeah, it, look, I was 35, so but I only got my first cap when I was 29. So I was a late bloomer, maybe. Well, I was a late bloomer, um, and I thought the ship had sailed. Uh, you had Declan Kidney as coach. You had two of the best locks in the game, Paulie and Doc. Donnacher O'Callaghan um so you know I certainly thought the ship had sailed and you know eventually I got there at 29 and you know I start playing some of my best rugby from 29 onwards um and the sad thing for me was my last game against France was you know I, I was starting second row um I started the Wales game I started the France game um and you know I had a bad concussion got stretched off got stood down for nine months after that um and I suppose I've been very lucky with injuries throughout my career, but that was the beginning of the end. That nine month period off, I came back. Um, then I had, uh, I, yeah, I got a, sorry, I'd signed for a two year for Narbonne, which at 35, it was really a four year because you get the two years and then I'm not sure, you'll probably be aware of the chômage where you can stay on an extra two years. So for a 35 year old, it was like a four year contract. So, you know, I wanted to, I always wanted to experience the South of France. Um, and you know, do finish in a way like that. But yeah, and I, I found somewhere to live, um, and everything. Started French lessons, and then, believe it or not, we were doing a morning session, and hyperextended my elbow very badly, and got real bad nerve damage, and failed my medical, and got um, advised to retire. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of scary. You think, you know, I was thirty five. I thought, you know, I'm not going to get injured, and I found it incredibly tough at thirty five. But I look back now, and I look at the likes of say. Lukey Fitz, who was 27, he played for the Lions and he had so much more to achieve in the game. Same with uh, Fez, Stephen Ferris. And, you know, I think, you know, I found it tough at 35, but I think how tough it must have been. I think Lukey was 27. Um, and I think that must have been tough for him to think, you know, I had another probably possibly eight years to play at the top level. So, you know, I, I take a, you know, I think I've got to be happy that I got to 35, even though I'd hoped to get to kind of 38. Yeah, look, it... it... There's no doubt it's really tough, Mike. And you know, when you're when you're playing the game, you're gonna part of you thinks you're gonna play forever, but part of you is also realistic that, you know, we all know that the average career is, you know, seven years in length. Once you're getting to 32, 33, 34, we're on borrowed time. But also the flip side of that is if you're thinking as a player, I think this is gonna be my last year, you know, I'm 34, I've I've had a good innings you're not going to be fully committed. You've got to be thinking, even at 35, you've got to be thinking, I'm going to keep going because you've got to keep yourself in shape. You know, if you're not putting the hours in in the gym, not as committed to the team, you're not going to be able to give of your best. So, you know, even at 35, I'm sure you were still very ambitious that you were going to be able to go over to Narbonne, make a difference with their squad, you know, be able to impart the knowledge onto their younger players and, and ultimately drive them on in, 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 in their competition. Yeah, Mads, that was yeah, that was certainly the case. You know, I, you know, as I said, that France game when I got that injury, I was playing some of my best rugby at, at thirty five years old. Um, so I definitely thought I had a lot more in the tank. Um, but I think partly I was wanting to continue playing as well was because the fear of the unknown of after rugby. You know, what what am I? What what am I going to do? Like I literally had no clue whatsoever. I was I was thinking, well, I should, a coach, an agent. Um, I just really didn't know and. I suppose I was panicking a bit and, you know, I I would have done anything to... So when I got told I had to retire through my elbow, I was desperate to 
for that not to be the case because I was like going into the unknown. I just didn't know. I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, it was scary. It was daunting. Um, but that's the thing, you know, you just got to be ready at any time that you could be injured. And, um, you know, life goes on. And now I'm realizing the period you play, I played for 17 years. That's a very small portion of your life that you will actually be working in the real world. So um, it's important to try and find something after after rugby um, that, that you enjoy and you're passionate about. And like, yeah, do you so miss you're, it? You're, yeah. Yeah, like you're one of the biggest characters, Mike, that I've come across in the game. You know, you're the life and soul of the, of the dressing room and always in the middle of a lot of jokes and, and you know, pulling the mick out of guys. Was that something that you missed? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, Mads, listen, if I was still a player, I would probably wouldn't be having a crack with you now on this on this <laughs> podcast. You know, like I, 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 I chatted to you earlier in the week and I said to you, I look back now and, you know, you know what I'm like in the change room, you know, I have a crack and I have the banter and I've got a weird sense of humor. And I love that. I love, I love, I, I loved, I love that part of being in the squad, being in the change room, having the crack and the banter. But like, I was pretended to be a bit of a robot when I was a player, you know, in the changing rooms, I'd be myself, I'd have fun, I'd have crack, you know, and I like to think when I cross that white line to train or be on the pitch, yes, I did some weird stuff during games, but you know, I I was physical and, you know, I gave it my all and emptied the tank. But, um, you know, probably around coaches, I, you know, I used to flick a switch. So if a coach came in the room, I'd pretend to be this serious guy, you know, I, cause I, I'd be, I'd overthink it. I think, oh, does the coach think I'm a joker? And I, I think I, I thought that would affect me with my selection. And I look back now and I see the characters, the likes of Ellis Genge, Joe Marler, um, you know, loads of guys now. And I, you know, I wish I was more of myself when I was a player. Do you think it's down to like, you know, the, even the media, like we never actually see the the real person. Like any time there's a post-match interview, you can almost guess what the players are going to say. It's the same script week in, week out. Yeah, they played well. Yeah, the fours did great. Yeah, you scored five tries. Oh, but it was everyone else. You know, you have to, you have to thank everyone else around you. It's I think it's it's down to media training and how you're supposed to be perceived as well, Mike. Yeah, Ima, I think you're dead right. I mean, it's it's very rehearsed, isn't it? I mean, because you know, whatever club you're at, when you when you're doing your media stuff on the Monday or the Tuesday, you know, you get the notes, you get the stats, you get you know which which players to to talk about, uh, you know, what what are their coaches' names, and you you know you get it's like you get everything given to you on a plate. Um, and I think it's getting better now, you know, people are, you know, not, you know, it's important people aren't afraid to be themselves and, you know, everyone's different. The world would be a very boring place if everyone was the same. And, you know, I think it's good that people are being encouraged to be themselves. You know, I liked fun. I liked having crack, but, you know, I worked, I worked bloody hard. Uh, and I, I think I worked a lot harder than, you know, a lot of people, but, you know, perhaps that perception of me, mucking around in a team room and having the crack and being strange, making noises, you know, you know, you don't realize that I'm one of the ones who's up in my bedroom at uh, Carton house working until like one o'clock looking at my plays and drawing stuff out. Um, you know, people never know what's going on behind the scenes, do they? Yeah. I think the value in, in guys getting their personality across and, and providing ultimately the public with better content you know, every so often someone's going to have a slip up and you're going to get in trouble, but on a balance, the the quality of content that clubs and, and international teams are putting out is going to be much better and you're going to get much better interaction with the fans. And I'm sure the, you know, the academy coaching that they're being getting are, are beginning to see the value in that and hopefully start advising, you know, the up and coming yeah, well, players to, to be comfortable well, in Mads, expressing themselves. I, I used to see some of the stuff Bristol put out on their Twitter and Instagram, Mads, and like obviously you've been there. They, they they put they put some um, hilarious stuff up. It's I mean I think it's fantastic. Yeah, like That's they're, they're pretty out there and yeah yeah and like ultimately like they they do tee themselves up to every so often they're going to put out some strong stuff on social media in the lead up to a game and th- you know they're not going to win every game. So you know you're, you're going to get a bit of a backlash if you put yourself out there. But you know I know the Bristol supporters absolutely love it. And I think yeah. other teams now are looking to, to not necessarily copy, but they're definitely taking elements of what the Bristol media team are doing. Um, and that's a real sign that, you know, you're doing something well, 
if if people are getting on the back of it and, and, and trying to copyright it, I suppose. That's it. Even last week, we saw Quinn Roo like slip up in an interview almost by Kirsten, but like it, it was all over Twitter, it was all over social media, and it was just an insight into the actual person, like the passion that he had against that Leinster against that Leinster team, and you know it was great to actually finally see the other side of the person, but instantly he he flipped back into media mode, like the minute he stopped laughing, it was back into media mode. So it's those kind of things you want to see, like you want to see a little bit of personality come out in the players and hopefully other teams can take a little leaf out of Bristol's book for sure. Ian, this is your opportunity. Any juicy gossip on, on Mike McCarthy? <laughs> Daddy likes it. Um, Daddy just, likes it. <laughs> just, just one story. One story about Mike. Oh, it's very hard and you put me on the spot like that. There was a good one back when uh, when Maddie O'Connor was coaching us. Um, we we scored a try in the corner. And, and Mike, you know, as all the players want to get in and celebrate with the try score. And Mike comes in and just roars, sausages! <laughs> and it, gets, it gets picked up on the ref's mic and on Maddie O'Connor's mic that he was, whatever, listening to the game on. And off the back of that, Maddie to this day, still calls Mike sausages. <laughs> do, you, do you know what that was, Mads? Do you know what that was, uh, Emo, as well? That, that was, that was, I think it was my first game away to Scarlet to Leinster. I was pretty apprehensive, wanted to make a good start. And I think it was just a release of nervous energy because, like, we scored a great try in the corner. I obviously didn't score it, but uh, Jimmy Gopler scored it. I think loads of lads came running in uh, Bossy came running in, and yeah, I just started roaring sausages, sausages, and like Jimmy and and Jimmy and uh, Bossy were just like looking at me like this, and then I started going, "Shut up, shut up, shut up," and then ran back, thought nothing of it, and then the video review on Monday, uh, Matt O'Connor and John O'Gibbs showed showed the clip, and you could hear me roaring sausages, and you know that's Jono, Jono and Matty called me sausages for the rest of the season, and. You know, I suppose that's, you know, sometimes another coach might have not liked that and it might have affected me um, for selection. But, um, you know, in that case, it was it was all right because I played pretty much every game. So It obviously worked well for your manager to see that um, that inside scoop of you. And like you said, to show a manager your, your personality. Did you get on well with him? Yeah, I got on really well with Matty and... Um, like John O'Gibbs, I thought was an amazing coach, and you know I, I, I I'd only had a year with John O'Gibbs. I, th- I thought he was great, um, and yeah, Matt O'Connor, like I thought he was great. Very different, very different, as you know. He was very laid back, um, very very laid back. But I thought he was good, and you know I played much of my better, best rugby under under Matt. And you know some I know some people don't agree he's a good coach, and everyone's got a different perception. But he gave me that freedom to kind of not stress too much about everything and believe in myself and I felt he's one coach I felt I could be myself in front of and it, you know wouldn't affect what they thought of me um but yeah I think uh, Mads you'll remember this I think to kind of sum him up I remember it's probably after that Scarlet's game the review on the Monday um you boys had all been used to Joe obviously unbelievable coach great detail works incredibly hard and you know, I'm, I'm, the, the video sessions must have been very in detail and pretty lengthy with Joe and Matty came in and Matty's video sessions, win, lose or draw, were about 30 seconds, a minute long. Um, and he'd always come in the meeting room and he'd go, right, gents, we'll make a start. And uh, he'd come in, literally so, show two or three clips. So they showed one clip and uh, I think Lukey, Lukey Fitz put his, put his hand up and said, um, Matt, so... Sorry, just there. If so, if if the forwards run in that hard line with their animated with their hands up, do you want the back? What do you want the back doing? Do you want him coming out on a like an overs line or an unders line? And there was a bit of a pause, and Matty just went, "Luke, you f- no, what did he say? Luke, how the fuck do I know you, bloody idiot?" <laughs> and like everyone was just, everyone was just like looking around, going, "Has he been serious?" But I don't think Matty knew the answer, and he just. Rip the, rip the piss out of Lukey. Uh, oh, that was it. Lukey, how the fuck do I know? And uh, <laughs> yeah, so like, oh, it's fine by me because I was just in, in the setup. But I think for you guys who'd be, had Joe for like three or four years before that, it was, you were like, wow, what's going on here? Um, so yeah, even in a video session, even if we lost, I remember we lost to Dragons and, you know, we were all panicking going, oh, this is going to be a horrendous video session. Then Matty just walks in, right, gents, we'll make a start. 
this week we're going to have to be considerably better than we were the week before. You show one bad <laughs> clip and two or three good clips, and you walked out going, "Oh, geez, that wasn't too bad." Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think I think with with Joe, obviously, like we had great success under him, and then Maddie came in and he had a very different style. Um, and it just took it took time for guys to get their head around that. But what I did find with Maddie when he did say something, so if he said, you know for me, he wanted me running with the ball loaded, running on a 45, louded lateral. And um, <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd have said that to me a few times. And, you know, Joe wanted me playing really square to the line. And that was all I really knew. Like Joe was the main coach who I'd had before Maddie. I, that style of play was working particularly well for me. So um, it took me probably three or four months to suddenly realize that I'm not going to get picked by this guy, Matt O'Connor, unless I start doing what he's telling me. And lads be kind of laughing and joking about him saying, you know, he's a funny guy or whatever. But ultimately, if you're not listening to what he's saying and implementing it, he was very rootless with selection. But for me, once I kind of figured that out, I think it was actually Owen Redden who imparted it to me that he said, look, everything that Matty says, just do it, regardless of you think it's in a lighthearted way. And it was really then that the penny dropped. And, you know, ultimately, I felt I, I played, you know, some of my best rugby under Matty. Yeah, remember the walkthroughs, Mads, with the difference between a walkthrough with Joe at Carton House. You know, you'd be like, I was a 35 year old man, absolutely bricking myself pretty much. Um, yeah. And then with Matt O'Connor, you know, you, you'd get it right because you knew you had to get it right. Whereas with Matty, yeah. you know, you'd make a mistake and you wouldn't be stressed at all because you'd just be like, right, run it again. And you'd, yeah. you might get yeah. three or four goes to run it. Whereas with Joe, it was like, try it once. If it doesn't work, move on. And you look at idiot. Yeah, correct. So, so Mike, uh, yeah. you've been retired for three years. So obviously you missed the crack, you missed the change rooms, you missed the boys, you miss Ian and, and Co. Um, but what have you been getting up to? You've been a bit of, you know, bit of broadcasting, bit of TV work. What else have you been up to? Yeah, um, look, I need the money. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, no, I so I stayed. I stayed in Dublin for a year, and I thought I'd settle in Dublin. When I was playing in Galway, I thought I'd settle in, settle in Galway. I lo- loved the place. Moved to Dublin, absolutely loved it. Um, myself, and my wife thought we'd we'd settle in Dublin, and I I worked in Dublin for about seven or eight months, and um, then we end up moving back to Newcastle. She's a Geordie. She's from Newcastle. We we we'd had a daughter, and you know we planned to have an, more kids. So. It just was right to get back and uh, have that kind of her her mum and her sister and that family support. So we we decided to move back, and I was kind of I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought a defence coach, um, you know, I thought I'd be good at that. But ultimately, we'd lived in seven different houses in ten years, so we thought I don't want to be moving around the place. So as I said, I thought about an agent or something, but you know, I just didn't know and. A role came up with the Rugby Players Association, which is the equivalent of um, Rugby Players Island. And yeah, so for two and a half years now, I've been doing the same role as Marcus Horan at Munster, which is a development manager. I work with Newcastle Falcons and Sale Sharks. So I've actually been working home from home since March. Um, but yeah, normally pre-COVID, I was doing two days in Sale in Manchester, two days in Falcons. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of off-field personal development, um, you know, and I think I can get the message across the lads in terms of, you know, I look back now I sh- and I wish I'd done more, should have done more, and, you know, I know I could have done more. So I'm trying to kind of give that message where I can without being pushy and, you know, it's just trying to signpost players to relevant courses, you know, help them with CVs or covering letters, try and find out what they might want to do. Um, you know, and then if they've got other issues or anything I can help them with, I can signpost them to the right support. So, you know, it's great. It's great to be in the clubs, two fantastic clubs, Newcastle and, and Sale. I love going in, but, you know, like it's kind of business for me, you know, when, when you play. When I go into the clubs, I don't, you know, act up. You know, I'm a guest in the club, so I'm, you know, I take it, I take it hugely seriously. Um and, you know, I suppose that's my nine to five. And when I get home, I can get a little bit wacky. So, um, but yeah, no, re- re- really, really enjoying it. So it's, it's it's great to stay involved in the game. Do you find, Mike, over the last 12 months, obviously with, with what's gone on with COVID and players seeing the fragility of the game, do you find players are more focused now on what they're doing outside of their errors in the club and, and trying to align themselves for a job after rugby? 
Mate, hundred percent. Uh, you know, I see it increasing. You know, I've only been out the game three years, but um, you know, especially with COVID, you know, there was that period in the Premiership where you know guys weren't in at the clubs training; they were just at home, uh, complete lockdown, and the the increase in player engagement with their development managers, you know, looking for courses, uh, you know, setting up a LinkedIn profile, you know, st- making a start on their CV, whatever it was, the, I think the engagement went up something ridiculous percentage uh, during that period. So definitely there's that uncertainty, uncertainty, and uns- how do you say that word? Uncertainty about the future and, you know, you know, what's, what's happening with the game? What does my future look like? There's a bit of panic and stress and definitely there's been a huge increase and, in, you know, guys, you know, you know, starting up businesses, starting courses, online courses. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been great to see. Um, but, you know, for me, looking back now, one, you know, one of the things I tell the young lads coming into the setups is, and, you know, I look, I look back at this, and I, I know this, but for those young guys, I say, like, you know, everyone wants to be perceived as a gladiator. You're coming into the setup you, you want to be perceived as being physically and mentally unbreakable. And, you know, that's often not the case. What people are going into the club and expressing and showing isn't necessarily how they're feeling on the inside. And, you know, it's important, you know, all that stuff about a stigma around mental health in the past. It's been great to see, you know, how far that's come along and encouraging people not to suffer in silence and to talk. And sorry, I'm probably moved on to another subject here, but, uh, yeah, um, you know, totally that's, been, that's been great for me to random. see. No, 100%. And I think RPI and the likes of what you're doing is totally needed. And, you know, it's, I suppose, making people realise before their career is over that, you know, there is life outside of rugby. Um, And I've seen them quite, you were saying there, a lot of people, a lot of people have set up businesses, you know, currently still playing, like even yourself, Ian, and then Jack McGrath set up a new gym and fitness stuff. So like they're doing it while still playing, you know, while keeping an eye on rugby, but also having, you know, an eye on the future yeah. as well, which is really, really great to see. Mike, it's been Ema, a pleasure Ema. to have you on. We yeah, Matt is very good at sales, isn't he? He keeps he keeps banging on to me about this CBD or something. <laughs> <laughs> Promotion here. How's it treating you, Mike? Have you been taking it? <laughs> yeah, it's good, mate. I was skeptical because I, I was googling it. I don't think there's any actual scientific proof, but I'm probably wrong there. But um, but I must admit, yeah, I right. definitely find it. I'm, I was never a great sleeper, but um, I've been sleeping amazing, um, and I think much deeper sleep. So. Um, here, I'll be ordering ordering a bit more, mate. How much did he pay you to say that? A, a few texts, <laughs> a few texts, yeah. yeah. Oh, Mike, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to chat to you here today, and you know we won't we, we won't leave it as long the next time to get you back on the show. Um, cheers Please to everybody don't. for watching and listening. Cheers to everybody for watching and listening. Don't forget, you can continue to get involved in our Facebook group and on Twitter. A big thank you to producer Pat, Paul, Dermot, Anthony, Paddy and everyone that helped getting this show together. This has been House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness Sloan Guffo. Sloan, thanks many for coming on, Mike. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe together with Guinness. Game changed.